Uh, good afternoon, welcome everyone. Uh, on behalf of the institutions uh, for development uh, department and the knowledge uh, department, it is my great pleasure to welcome Ambassador uh, Kaspere Klinge uh, from Denmark. I want to invite uh, from uh, an honor guest from our exceptional voices. The Ambassador Kling is the world's first technology ambassador of Bali. And that is very interesting because now we have something could be tech diplomacy or techno diplomacy. And he's pioneering a new ways for doing diplomacy by building direct ties, not with countries this time, as he has done in the past, but also with, uh, but now with tech companies like Facebook, Apple, uh, and Google. Uh, uh, ambassador Klein, Kling has been ambassador of Denmark to uh, more than five countries in Asia, Europe, and Africa, and we're very grateful that he's coming today to put a light in Latin America and the Caribbean. So currently he's filling the first ever technology position in Silicon Valley with a global man that also includes presence in Copenhagen and Beijing. So you have the opportunity to listen and for us that have been following all the developments of technology, I think it becomes very clear that technology has become a global changer. You might like it, you might dislike it, but I think there's no doubt that the presence of technology is exponentially is changing and is affecting our lives the, the rules of the game because the big companies are now the truly uh, influential players. So if we know that technology as has been of course in the news recently is running a lot of our lives from democracy, data, regulation, competition, we really want to have ambassadors that are presenting in those tables and those decisions the key values of uh, the developed, uh, developing world. So with that, I'm very, very happy to have ambassador here. We have organized this presentation the following way. Uh, the ambassador is going to make a presentation for about 20 minutes. Then we have the president of the bank uh, uh, talking with him, and I hope that with that and with your question, we'll really uh, squeeze the opportunity to learn a lot about what is diplomacy in the 21st century and how we make sure that the opportunities of the digital transformation becomes powerful um, for us to thrive and we minimize the externalities that comes associated with it. With that, thank you very much and a big uh, applause to receive Ambassador Kasper Klinge. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, listen, just before coming in here, I heard there's been a discussion for some time about getting a Dane uh, to speak to you here today, and I understand that one of the other candidates were the Crown Princess of Denmark. So let me begin by apologizing that uh, she's not here and you have to settle with, uh, with me today. It, it's, it's really no comparison. So I think perhaps today is unexceptional voices, but I appreciate that all of you are here to listen to, to what we're going to say. Um, one, of, one of the things that is different with this uh, position um, is that I rarely wear a tie anymore. Um, you know, when you live and work in Silicon Valley, it's, uh, it's in jeans, it's in sneakers, it's in t-shirts, so it's actually also a good pleasure for me to be here today to use some of the suits that I've invested in for, for many, many years. Listen, Joker Sai, thanks for, for being here. Also, thank you to, to the president of the bank for listening in, and I look forward to the conversation we're going to have afterwards. We, we cheated a little bit by having a, a short tete-a-tete uh, -tete before, uh, before coming here. Um, what we're trying to do in Denmark uh, and I should begin by saying that this is a foreign policy experiment. Uh, we don't know exactly how this is going to end up, but we think it is important. And this is basically a response to two international trends that we think are out there, and we're probably not the only ones who've seen this. The, the first trend is that uh, some of the big tech companies are becoming very large organizations, very powerful organizations. Um, if you take a company like Apple, their annual turnaround is more or less the same as Denmark's GDP. If you take the big GAFAs, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple, uh, the value of their stocks here in the beginning of 2018 is more or less the same as the GDP of France. So I think it shows, or at least that's our interpretation, that we need to reinvent our relationship with the tech companies 
and to some extent begin treating them a little bit like we do our bilateral relations with uh, countries uh, all over the world. And I'll come back to the, some of the criticism that we've been facing because of uh, this new approach. The, the other trend is looking at technology and digitalization as the key defining parameter for global affairs in the 21st century. Uh, what we think is that we need to begin looking at, at technology in a way which is similar to how we look at many other global issues. Uh, we think that technology will define the winners and losers of uh, tomorrow. It will define who will make it and who will not, both on an individual basis, but also on a regional basis, on a country basis. Um, and as a country that is committed to uh, supporting and contributing to the parts of the world that uh, are not as fortunate as we might be ourselves, it's about looking at how we can make sure that we don't create a digital divide, that we don't create you know, spots on the map that are digital poor, that will not be able to reap the benefits of technologies that will be coming in our direction. So there's a very, very clear development aspect of what we are trying to do. And there is an international dimension where we try to see dimension to, to this. Uh, we're very used to look at balance of power. Uh, what we are arguing is that perhaps we need to look at artificial intelligence or machine learning or the blockchain, perhaps even IoT, access to IoT and 5G technology as parameters that will define the balance of power and the geopolitical structures of tomorrow, who will be the superpowers and who will not be uh, the superpowers. So those are the two trends that is uh, behind the Danish government's decision to um, establish uh, my position and, and also create what we call the tech representation. Um, and that's actually an important point because uh, I get a lot of questions on, you know, what on earth are you actually doing? You know, fancy title, uh, hooray, and congratulations to Denmark for, for doing th something uh, unorthodox, but is this just, you know, about putting Denmark on the map and, uh, you know, public diplomacy, or is there real substance uh, below, the, uh, below the screen? And I will say there is, just to put that out there. <laughs> but, but one of the ways of looking at what we're trying to do is actually to consider us like an embassy um, very much like embassies uh, we have all over the world or your countries have all, all over the world. The only difference is we're not an embassy to a country, we're an embassy to an industry and to all our friends in, uh, in countries and international organizations uh, all over the world. And what does that mean in practice? Well, it means two things. F first of all, where my mandate is slightly different than most of my colleagues is that I have a global mandate. Um, so in, in the introduction, I think uh, your colleague mentioned that my team is not only in Silicon Valley, that's where I'm uh, located together with my deputy, Michael, who is uh, hiding over there. Um, we decided to take Palo Alto because it's a bit of a hardship posting and we thought well, California will take that one. Then we have uh, colleagues sitting in Copenhagen in Denmark. We have colleagues now sitting in Beijing in China. And we're actually opening up uh, an office in Nairobi in Kenya in a couple of months time. We have not done this before. I'm sure there are other countries who have done this, but we haven't had a global representation with a global state. And that's, uh, that's a new approach. Um, and I was just joking with, uh, with some colleagues uh, downstairs, upstairs. I've lost complete orientation moving into this place, but with some colleagues, and I see some of them are here today. Um, that this is a good idea in many ways, except when you're trying to have morning meetings with the whole team together, because it's possible across uh, those uh, time zones. But except that, we are performing a very traditional embassy role. We're getting instructions from our ministries back home. Uh, one day it can be on taxation issues, the other day it can be on uh, you know, the transportation issues, sharing economy uh, questions, uh, Uber, Lyft, etc criminal investigations aspects. And the only difference is, of course, that I don't walk down to a foreign ministry, but rather I take those conversations with some of the big tech companies. And the reason I point this out is that some of the criticism that we are facing uh, on a regular basis is that we are now ruining the international architecture by elevating the tech companies to non-democratically elected uh, entities. In other words, we are 
destroying the Westphalian uh, understanding of, uh, of international affairs. But I think it's based on a complete misconception, both of what diplomacy is like and also what our role is about. Because this is not about sugarcoating the big tech companies. It's not about helping them with their commercial activities. It's not about giving them access to, to the Danish market in an in a easier way. Uh, what we're doing is actually having very, very tough negotiations and discussions with them on real issues. Um, one day it could be about getting access for Danish police authorities to investigating terrorism um, cases or cases of criminal activities. The next day it could be, and this is a, a concrete uh, example, could be about discussing taxation issues with Airbnb in order for Airbnb platform to adhere to the Danish taxation system. That believe that that is an easy conversation <laughs> should come and join some of the meetings that we're having with the tech companies. Because they're very difficult, uh, very difficult questions and very difficult discussions. And, and one thing that I would actually argue, I, I used to be, before coming to, to California, was our bilateral ambassador in Indonesia and Jakarta. And it was easier for me to get a meeting with the president of Indonesia, the world's fourth largest country, than it has been to get a meeting with some of the big tech companies in, uh, in Silicon Valley. Um, when you, when you take away the vanity that I mentioned that, we actually think that's a democratic problem. And when our police authorities are not able to get access to, to uh, counterparts and some of the big tech companies on real investigations, that's a huge democratic problem. Or if the platforms that are transnational, they don't, they don't know and they don't respect the boundaries that we have, where they don't generate taxation to our system, that's a major uh, problem and a major issue for us as well. So what we have now is actually a platform to have that conversation with the companies, um, to try and find a way forward. And that's why we think that we're bringing back diplomacy actually to its roots. It's always been about putting people into hotspots. In the old days, it was about putting people into conflict areas. Now we think technology is a new conflict area or the new potential area for transformation. And we need to be present on the ground, uh, not only to deal with the issues, but also to help prepare our own societies for the changes that might be coming uh, our way. And that's actually one of the differences between what we're doing and, uh, and uh, in the pretty much work in the nexus between foreign policy and domestic policies. Um, and, and that's a little bit of a different uh, approach. So we work with a lot of Danish authorities also bringing back knowledge, sending analysis, giving input to policy processes, about how do we prepare Denmark for the world's fourth industrial revolution with all the opportunities that it brings, but also making sure that we are prepared for, for the changes that is uh, coming in, uh, in our direction. And that again is a little bit different compared to what we've been doing uh, in the past. There are other aspects of, uh, of our mandate and I won't be able to go into all details of it. The only thing I would say is that the blessing of this new creation is that we can basically do everything. It's everything from development cooperation to cybersecurity issues. It's about the uh, foreign and security policy dimension and then about our domestic uh, reform agenda. But actually one of the most important points and that's one of the reasons why we're very happy to be here with you today is the global institutional setup. Um, and when you're meeting with companies uh, on an almost daily basis, or you're seeing some of the technologies uh, out and about, you can get, get two things. First, a sense of urgency that we need to really begin adjusting our societies for the new realities of the world. Um, and the other one is, and I'm be a little, I'll be a little bit provocative on this one, that we might be facing the end of governance as we know it if we don't get our act together and begin defining a new institutional setup, or perhaps even more importantly, to reinvent the relationship between the private sector and the public sector. Now, I come from a country where we uh, don't shy away from bringing the private sector into our legislative work and our regulatory work. And what we're trying to do is actually to, you know, transform that uh, approach also to the international level. Uh, I think the fourth industrial Revo revolution will challenge our ability to regulate and legislate simply because of the pace of new technologies. And the response to that is not to legislate or regulate in blindness. It is to invite the private sector to 
be part of the process, but also to have them take a responsibility which is proportional to the kind of influence that they're exercising. And how is that going? <laughs> well, uh, one, one of the initial findings that uh, I'll share with you today, which is not uh, exactly rocket science, but that is that we tend to see the tech companies, not only the ones here in, in uh, the US, but also the ones in, in Asia, Alibaba, Tencent, uh, including uh, the few that we have in Europe, uh, Latin America as well, as sort of one monolithic uh, group of, of organizations. I think that's not the right way to look at it. There are very different approaches. Some of them have been very forward-leaning, wanting to have uh, collaborations and dialogues with us. Others, as I mentioned before, it's been extremely difficult to get uh, access to and also have access to, to governments. That's also one of the reasons, and I was actually just talking to the president about this uh, a few minutes ago, that one of my KPIs, one of the things that we're hoping to this initiative is actually not to be tech ambassador in this world, but rather to have other countries, like-minded countries, international organizations to do something which is similar, because we cannot do it alone. You know, I'd be, I'd be lying if I said that we don't enjoy having uh, the first uh, tech representation of the world, because it, it puts you know, much needed attention around the small country of Denmark, but actually we're hoping that other countries will do it very soon, because we need to be more people around the table, otherwise we won't be able to influence the direction of the tech companies, and therefore, in our view, the direction that uh, the world will basically heading, uh, be heading towards. So, report back to your capitals. Make sure that uh, I won't be too lonely out in Silicon Valley. I would like a lot of playmates so we can also have uh, National Day receptions and all the good stuff that diplomacy brings with it. Um, joke aside, I really actually hope that you will talk to, to colleagues and, uh, and capitals on this. And I think also if we can have the bank itself come up with an approach which is along the same lines, that would be extremely welcomed. We are seeing other countries and other international organizations <coughs> excuse me, uh, doing something that is a little bit in, in line with what we're doing. Uh, the Office of the, High of the High Commissioner for Human Rights will establish an office in Silicon Valley uh, in not too distant the future. The European Union has created a tech office in Brussels, and we are in conversations with many, many countries, including countries in Latin America, um, seeing a lot of countries trying to uh, basically mirror or come up with uh, something along uh, our lines, and I think that is important, and we would like to see uh, more of that. I think I will finish here um, and then look forward to, to the conversation uh, with, uh, with the president, and uh, feel free to answer, ask any questions. If you have difficult questions, my deputy will answer those, and I will take the easy ones.